me first uh, introduce these three talks. Uh, first, Florence will uh, take the floor and will uh, talk about the notion of decision, uh, both in business and law, I think. Uh, and uh, she will raise the issue that we already um, uh, met in uh, the difference between prediction and prescription. Then Gregory uh, will talk uh, about the present-day digitalization of law uh, that can be traced back to the philosophical project of Leibniz. But uh, he will also insist on uh, very contemporary examples. And as far as I am concerned, I will also go back to Leibniz, uh, maybe uh, in a more philosophical way, since I'm not a um, uh, legal uh, professional. Um, and, um, well, I think that's, that's all. And I think, um, Florence, if you will take the floor now. All right, so um, we have been discussing um, learning technologies um, over the past hours. Um, and it is true that now we are facing the possibility to have a um, machine making more and more important decisions. Um, and the main example that I might give about this is, for example, and we mentioned it already, the development of autonomous cars where artificial intelligence uh, makes driving decisions. So today, automated decisions could become more and more frequent in the course of business, but also in law making. And this is why I would like to go back to what analytics are and how this is possible today. So according to Gartner, which is one of the world's leading company in information technology, analytics is a discipline that applies logic and mathematics to data uh, to provide insights for making better decisions. Then Gartner identifies four analytic capabilities um, in order to help businesses to take actions um, on, based on, on data questions. The first uh, capability is called descriptive analytics. Descriptive analytics are used to answer the question, what happened? Uh, and and the, the answer will be provided by querying data and summarizing um, um, data, like a sales report, for example, a sales report by geography. So most management reporting in business uh, uses this type of analysis. And business leaders are accustomed to um, use this information. Then second, you have what could be called diagnosis analytics that are used to answer the question, why did it happen? And this kind of analytics helps us understand why outcomes, events, or trends occurred. Like, for example, if employees are leaving a certain company, there will be an analysis in order to understand that turnover. But the third step is predictive analytics that we have discussed so far. And those kind, this kind of analytics is used to answer the question, what will happen? And this uh, analysis provides forward-looking insights by recognizing patterns and assessing likely outcomes. So with the help, of course, of st statistical techniques and machine learning techniques. So as we already said, this is used to predict future behaviors or to estimate certain outcomes, even courts' decisions. But then there is today another step which is prescriptive analytics. And they are used to answer the question, what should I do? So rather than estimate 
future outcomes, prescriptive analytics specifies a preferred course of action. So in that way, prescriptive analytics can be regarded as the conclusive step after predictive analytics. In other words, um, the predictions that are provided by predictive analytics are used to optimize decision and to suggest decision. And prescriptive analytics deliver, in that context, the best decision by taking into account um, objectives, constraints, cr criteria, certain criteria. So today, all analytics methods are used together at different stages by organizations <coughs> in order to make decisions. However, uh, predictive analytics is very recent and prescriptive analytics are not really uh, used uh, um, uh, today so or developed in, in organization. It will, it will in the next five, ten years. So um, here we are because prescriptive analytics are the tool that is used to automate, uh, to make <coughs> automated uh, decisions. So since predictive methods may be used um, to inform or influence human decisions, there is still uh, some um, freedom left to humans. However, prescriptive analytics say exactly what the best route is. And it is usually said that Google's self-driving car makes extensive use of prescriptive analytics. <coughs> so then those techniques are starting to be used for business decisions, and they will be more and more used. An example of this is credit scoring algorithm uh, that are used by banks. These algorithms use financial data to construct credit scores, and these scores are supposed to tell the bank the likely credit risk of any particular customer. So those tools are decisive in determining whether or not a person can access credit. In that way, uh, prescriptive analytics leads to the automatization of this kind of decision. And today, people used to say that the automatization will uh, concern mostly operational decisions, like routine decisions related to uh, the day-to-day -day running of, of, of business, pricing, stock, customer services. And there are, of course, advantages for this. Um, labor costs are reduced. It is said that the quality of decisions is improved and also prescriptive analytics allow to scale, sorry for the typos, uh, uh, allows to scale the number of decisions. However, there are also objections. Some people say that those automated decisions are not as effective and accurate as people say. And there is also the question with fairness, because since everything is automated, you will not focus on the peculiarities of uh, the people that are um, concerned and affected by the decision. So today, the number of organizations would take a uh, significant decision about individuals by fully automated tools is relatively small. Uh, there is often some human intervention in making the decisions. However, the number of automated decisions will probably rise in the future. So then, what about the decisions made by the courts or made by public authorities? Um, this is not obvious. Um, 
Yes, we've seen this morning that predictive analytics are currently developing in the legal world. And we said this morning that, for example, um, risk scarring is, is used for bail decision. I, I mentioned this morning that report uh, called very recent, that, that is called human decisions and machine prediction, uh, predictions that um, uh, show that um, algorithms are better at predicting what defendants will do after release than judges. And those tools are currently used in various jurisdictions in the United States. So in that way, predictive analytics are used in order to help judges make their decision. But it's just a help to make the decision. It's not making the decision itself. However, since those assessments are very close to prescriptions, the decision here is based on the flight risk assessed by the machine, we are very close to automated decision making. So it will probably be more and more used for uh, various uh, question that are dealt with by judges uh, on a regular basis. And that's why certain authors say that predictive technology can go further than simply, simply telling us what the law is. It can also be used to inform us what the law should be. Here, I think that there is an issue of principle. If court decisions or the decisions of public authorities are automated, automated. And I'm stealing an expression that I uh, found in, in John Danaher's blog, the threat of algocracy. Um, what is algocracy? It is when algorithms take over from the human process of democratic decision making. And he says, this creates a sort of prison of, prison of invisible barbed wire, which constrains our intellectual and moral development, as well as all lives, as all lives more generally. In other words, big data would be undermining democracy by depriving us of our ability to think for ourselves, to determine our own path in life, and to critically engage with decision making. So of course, at the heart of this criticism, there is the debate about what legitimates a decision, especially a decision made by an authority. If you think that legitimation derives from outcomes, then you could just say that the machine is able to, to um, take the results into account and to take into account various goals and to accomplish those goals. So there is no problem with automated decision making. However, if you think that legitimation comes from um, the procedures the procedure used to make the decision, then there is a problem with automatization. And for the people who are, feel threatened by algocracy, um, it is obvious that algorithms undermine freedom and autonomy, and that they prevent active participation in and comprehension of decision-making procedures. I had another point, but I may go very fast on it since it implies that I explain what, what nudge is, and probably we could discuss it later, but some author said, algocracy is a kind of hyper-nudging, um, meaning that um, regulators could construct choice architectures 
to nudge people into preferred behavioral patterns. There is um, a third objection here, which is the fact that um, making decisions by relying on what happened in the past would be a bar to innovation. Like if the algorithms suggest decisions by only relying on existing and previous case law. And then the law would stop changing and the law would stop developing and this, the law would stop to adapt to uh, the evolution of society. I'm not sure that this objection is that convincing since algorithms thinks machines are able to take into account outcomes and goals and they will suggest and propose decisions um, um, that can be completely new. So I'm not sure of this argument. So if I sum up here, um, decision support tools have been used in business from a long time now. Of course, today we are getting more and more surrounded by predictive analytics and now prescriptive analytics. However, what I would like to highlight is the fact that the decisions made by courts or by public authorities cannot be compared to business decisions. Yes, they involve aspects of freedom, aspects of autonomy, and democracy. That's why um, this professor of computer science, uh, Kleinberg, Kleinberg, who just wrote that report that I mentioned previously, concluded algorithms are only a lens into human decision making. They are not meant to make the decisions themselves. A few last remarks about uh, the need to regulate automated decision making once it is established that businesses and organizations will more and more use um, machine learning techniques. Um, there are two things that are, three things that are important here. Um, the fact that, of course, uh, the data subjects should be given the possibility not to be um, affected by automated decisions, that they should be given the right to object. Second, that data subjects should be given information about the way the decisions are made by the machines. And third, there must be a solution regarding the question of discrimination since data may be, data samples may be too small or they may be based upon incorrect or incomplete assumptions or statistics, there are questions of bias and discrimination. So there should be solution for this. And here, those aspects have recently been taken into account by the European regulation, uh, the General Data Protection Regulation, that was adopted uh, um, one year ago, uh, April 14, 2016. There is specifically an Article 22 entitled Automated De Individual Decision Making that deals with <coughs> algorithms currently in use, like recommendation systems, uh, um, credit assessment, etc., etc. So, according to this Article 22, data subject um, should have the right not to be subject to a decision based solely on automated processing, including profiling, which produces legal effects concerning, concerning that individual or significantly affects that individual. So, some people say that this right to object is very limited. Why? Because an individual can only object where the algorithm produces a legal outcome or a similar outcome that adversely affects that individual. 
There is no right to object. For example, according to that regulation, there is no right to object when the profiling in, is necessary for the entering into a contract or where the individual has expressly consented to the automated decision making. But here, there is a right to object that is um, uh, applicable in cases where an automated decision affects individual. The second aspect is that this European regulation um, provides for a right to explanation, which means that uh, data subjects are entitled to meaningful information about the logic involved, as well as the significance and the envisaged consequences when automated decision-making or profiling takes place. This is not an easy task, and I think, uh, well, I noticed that many, many people doubt of the possibility, of the feasibility of explaining algorithms, uh, especially, for example, for neural networks that are very opaque and very hard to understand. So some people say and that there was very recently a study published by um, the Alan Turing Institute and the Oxford Internet Institute that said there is no real right to explanation in that regulation because this is not feasible. And it was also highlighted in that report that um, there was the, the, the right to explanation was so restricted um, in that text that um, it was not uh, really, um, um, uh, it, it did not really exist. Um, so the scope of this would be too limited, is too limited according to those authors, and even if it wasn't so limited, it is not feasible. The third aspect of that regulation is the question of bias and discrimination. As you know, um, machine learning depends upon data that has been collected and it was collected from society. So to the extent that society contains inequality, exclusion, uh, traces of discrimination, then so will the data. And um, indeed, machine learning can reify existing patterns of discrimination. If they are found in the training data set, then they will be reproduced. So this was highlighted, as, that's, as I said this morning, in two um, reports, in two White House reports that were published um, this, uh, in 2016, the first in May and the second in October, actually. And they were, uh, those, both those reports were concerned about the question of discrimination um, in criminal sentencing, but not only, like, for example, in hiring practices, um, in um, um, uh, credit uh, assessment, etc., etc. So here, the European regulation uh, mentions the question of algorithmic discrimination, and there is specifically uh, an Article 9 that provides for the removal of special categories of that from data sets used in automated decision making. So there is um, a prohibition against the processing of data revealing racial or ethnic origin and other special categories. And this is also the case in Article 22 that deals with automated decision making since uh, it is impossible to make a decision and base it on the special categories of personal data referred to in that Article 9. So here again, um, the um, question of discrimination um, is apparently solved by those regulations 
this regulation. Um, we can doubt this. And again, this report from the Alan Turing Institute and the University of Oxford uh, said, here, a watchdog is needed. Uh, there is a need for the creation of an artificial intelligence watchdog to act as an independent third party that could intervene when automated decisions create discrimination. So when there is no human intervention in an outcome that is based on algorithmic automated decision, then um, there should be uh, a corrective solution. So th this watchdog. Um, my conclusion would be that um, all those provisions, all those rules today apply to the automated decisions made in business. I don't think that, as I previously said, uh, we will see many decisions um, automated in uh, the judicial world, even though judges may use uh, predictive solutions as a help, as a tool. Um, probably, and that would be my final question, we might imagine a uh, routine decision from judges, automated, like we discussed this morning, uh, child supports um, uh, decisions. We can raise that question. That would be my, my last point. Thank <laughs> you.